Okay, let's talk about how to construct a frequency distribution table. In particular, in this video, we're going to talk about how to find the class width, the upper and lower class limits, and then finally, how to calculate that frequency in our frequency table. Okay, let's do this with an example. So suppose I have um, the 1.5 mile run times uh, for 45 sailors in the U.S. Navy. Okay, and so here's all their data. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to highlight all this data and copy it into Excel. So I'll highlight it and then I'll press Control C. Then I'll copy it and then open an Excel book and I'll go ahead and paste it here. So Control V. Uh, it, comes out looking a little strange so there should be this little marker down here with control paste options so we'll choose the second paste option which makes it match the destination formatting um, also each data is not in its own cell right so I'll go to data up top text to columns delimited next and have it separate by comma not by tab so now every time there's a comma, they're going to put it the data in a new cell. And then press finish. Okay, I could have just copied all that data by hand over into Excel, but 45 observations, it's pretty likely I'll make a mistake. Um, control X, Control V. Okay, basically, let's get it all in one column. Control X, scroll down, Control V. So the last thing I want to do in my Excel notebook is go ahead and label this variable. So what is this variable? This is the 1.5 mile run time um, in minutes. Okay, so notice that the unit is minutes. So when it says 9.5, that's nine and a half minutes. Right, nine minutes, 30 seconds. So it's important that you have your, your unit correct and that you understand your unit. Okay. So I have my data in Excel. It'd be a lot easier for me to calculate things and use that data. Um, so the first step in constructing a frequency distribution table is to find the class width. Remember what we're doing when we are finding a class width? Um, basically, if all of the data were on a number line and down here is the min observation or the smallest observation and up here is the max or the largest observation, what we're doing when we find the class width is basically what we want to say is we want to go ahead and break up this data into classes or bins, right? Which basically says, okay, all the data here, that's going to be one class. All the data here is going to be one class. This is going to be another class. And they all need to be equally sized classes, right? So it's not that the last class is bigger than the first, right? Maybe in this drawing I might have made it bigger, but the idea would be that they're all equally spaced classes. And the class width would be this width here. Okay, you want to make sure that you choose a class width that covers all of your data, meaning it, it covers the min and it covers the max. So all of them need to be equally spaced. All right, so basically what this is, is basically the max minus the min divided by the number of classes you want to use. So here I want to use five classes. So let's go ahead and go back to our Excel data. It's very tempting for people to choose the first observation as the min, scroll down, last observation as the max. Unfortunately, this data is not sorted. So another great reason why we have it in Excel is that it's very easy to sort data in Excel. If I click on A, it'll highlight all the data. And then if I go to, on the top ribbon, I say data. And then there's this sort option right here. Click on that. My data has headers, and that's the variable name, sort by, okay? And then just press OK. It'll go ahead and sort it from smallest to largest. 
So what is our smallest observation? 8.4 is our smallest observation, and our biggest observation is 13.81. Okay. So down here, our smallest observation is 8.4 and 13.81. Okay. So if I take that 13.81 and minus 8. 4, and then divide by the number of classes, five classes. Okay. In the numerator, I get 5.41 divided by 5. Okay. And then I get 1.082. Now we'll always round up the class width so that we make sure that we cover the entire data. Okay. If I were to round down, then these classes may be too small. And if the classes are too small, we're not going to cover the last observation. So it's very important that we always round up, always round up a little bit. Okay, so for 1.082, I could round it up to 1.09. That would be rounding up. Um, although it's a little easier to count by, one point. One zero, so I can round up a little bit more to make it a, a little easier to count by, a little easier of a class width to use. Um, but when I round up, I need to make sure that there is such thing as rounding up too much. Okay, and if you round up too much, then what will happen is your class widths will basically be so big that you'll have. Um, you'll have classes without any data in it, okay? And you never want that. You don't want one of your um, classes towards the end to not have data in them, okay? If classes in the middle don't have data in them, that just means that your data is you know, really well spread out and for some reason it doesn't have data in the middle. But if classes on the end don't have data in them, that means you, you rounded up too much on your class width, okay? So, but I think 1.10 um, will be a good, it's a little bit of a roundup, and it's an easy number to count by. All right. So once I've determined, I've figured out what class width I want to use, I'm ready to construct my um, lower and upper class limits. So always start with your lowest observation. Our lowest observation was 8.40. And from there, use whatever class width you found and add it to find the next lower class limit. So add on 1.10. You see how that's nice and easy to add on? I don't even need a calculator. 9.550. Okay. Then do it again. Add on 1.10. That's going to be 10.60. Very easy to add on, 11.70. And then lastly, 12.80, okay? So technically that's where we stop, right? We only need five classes. So you see five lower class limits. However, it's a lot of times it's easier to go, it's nice and convenient to go one more. Um, and that'll help us find the upper class limit of that last class. So I'm gonna go ahead and go one more 13.90, and I'll erase that 13.90 at the end because that's just for convenience, okay? Okay, so now to find my upper class limits, basically what I want to do is I want to go one less, a little bit less, so then the next lower class limit. So for this upper class limit, it's going to be 9.49. See, it's just a little bit less than the next lower class limit. Okay, here this one would be 10.59. Okay, so you guys are getting it, 11.69. So lastly, you see that this is why it's nice for us to have gone a little bit further in finding that, um, that lower class limit of the class that doesn't exist because it helps us find this low, upper class limit here. So it would be 13.89. Okay, so let's erase all the stuff we don't need. 
All right, so here we go. This is all of our upper and lower class limits. So notice that I put our upper and lower class limits together in the same column, and this is usually how you'll see them, okay? So in the previous slide, when I had them on two separate columns, that was just for convenience for us to find, um, to find them. Uh, but ultimately what this is, is it's a range, right? So we start at the lower and we go to the upper. So we can combine this information together. Um, so 8.4 to 9.49, you see that's right here, okay? And so these upper and lower class limits can be shown together in the same column. All right, so now we're ready to find our frequencies. To find our frequencies, I'll need to go back to my Excel data. And this is another reason why it's really nice that my Excel data is sorted, okay? So if I go to the top, this first class is 8.4 to 9.49. So basically what I need to do is I need to count how many observations are in that range, okay? So I start 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, okay? I'll stop there, 18 observations on the first class. Okay, so now how many observations are, are between 9.50 and 10.59? Go back to my Excel data. Okay, it's so basically counting all the way until I get to 10.59. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, 12 observations in that second class. Okay, until I get, now I'm looking until I get to 11.69. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, just 7 observations in that next class. And now I'm counting until I get to 12.79. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 7 observations there. And lastly, in the last class, Looks like I have just one observation. All right, before you say you're done, it's always a very good idea to double check. If you were to add up all your frequencies, okay, your total frequency, add up all your frequencies, 18 plus 12 plus seven plus seven plus one equals 45. It should equal whatever your sample size is, N.